hello. <laughs> I'm gonna lower my mask because we're not around people. I'm outside, chill out. You can understand me better this way. Okay, great. Today we're gonna be doing a little tour of the Lower East Side. Yes, that's right. Oh my God, how amazing is that? Or should I say OMG, like the kids do. We're starting here in the Lower East Side. We're on North Fork Street. We're gonna walk up to Housen, head west, tour around the area, see all the stuff, lots of history here. But I started here because of this building. This building is the Angel Orensands Foundation. This is the oldest surviving synagogue building in New York City from 1849. Um, it actually went through different stages. It originally was for the German Jews, who were some of the first in this neighborhood. Uh, then Angel Orensands discovered it after it had been abandoned in the 1970s and turned it into an art center. In fact, it's like an event space, all that kind of stuff. In fact, uh, Matthew Broderick and Sarah Jessica Parker, SJP, got married here, and uh, Avril Lavigne shot a music video here. That's a pretty random fact, I know, but uh, Avril Lavigne, she's the one who sings uh, the Skater Boy song. You know. He was a skater boy, she said, see you later, boy, she was, that one. That was pretty good. But anyways, with that, I think we're going to start, go uh, get started and go down to Houston and uh, do the Lower East Side. Really cool neighborhood here in New York. I'm going to throw this coffee away. Let's go. So we are walking up to Houston Street, uh, which is the border, really, between the Lower East Side and the East Village, which is to the north of it. Now, you'll notice, too, we're on Norfolk Street. You have Rivington, Stanton, all these streets that have names on them, right? Um, now, the reason is because we're off the grid. I've mentioned this in plenty of uh, tours before, but the grid of Manhattan begins at Houston Street, which is pronounced Houston. Remember that, not Houston. It's spelled like Houston, but it's pronounced Houston because it's named after a man whose last name was William Houston, with an O-U-N at the end. Uh, but over time, the spelling warped into Houston, but it's still pronounced Houston for him. So don't go up to anyone and say, how do I get to Houston Street, or they're gonna know you're a tourist, and they're gonna rob you. And so the grid begins to the north, as does the East Village. I actually did a video about the East Village. You should check that out. Sick plug, baby. I'm gonna take a left here. You see that clock up there? It's got the wrong time. A little art piece. I guess that's what qualifies as art. Clocks with the wrong time. So here to the right, you can see uh, Avenue A. Uh, Avenue A is kind of Alphabet City. So to the east, as it goes east, the, the letters go up, A, B, C, D. Uh, this is all Alphabet City. And then to the left, to the west of it, is the East Village. I used to live here, actually. I lived on 6th Street back when I was a lawyer, <coughs> and I could afford it. Lived by myself, a little bachelor pad. <laughs> and I don't do that anymore. I've actually gone backwards in my life, but that's OK, trying to go back up. Alphabet City, by the way, was home to kind of some of the most dangerous neighborhoods like the 90s. There was a lot of drugs and stuff. In fact, there was a saying that uh, the further east you went, it, was, it got more dangerous because you were further from the trains. So the, as you went east, it got more dangerous. There was a saying, if you were on Avenue A, you were all right. If you were on B, you were brave. If you were on C, you were crazy. And if you were on D, you were dead. Pretty cute little nursery rhyme, huh? Throw this away. Also want you to notice, it was not a Starbucks cup. I'm gonna drink no stinking Starbucks here. You start seeing some of the synagogues and uh, old synagogue buildings that are still left here. Now the Lower East Side was a Jewish neighborhood, a very, very famous Jewish neighborhood uh, throughout the late 1800s, early 1900s. But it didn't start that way. This used to be uh, basically land outside of the city, uh, like, the, like after the Revolutionary War. Two big landowners here, uh, Rutgers, Henry Rutgers and James Delancey. We're gonna talk about both of them as we go. But then that land was partitioned off, some of it by force. And we'll also talk about that. And then it was sold as housing as the city started expanding north out of lower Manhattan. Here to the left, you have Katz's Deli. It was founded in 1888. In fact, the Iceland brothers started a kosher restaurant here. And then a man named Willie Katz joined on. And then he took it over in 1910. And they changed the name to Katz's Deli. Katz's Deli, very famous for the movie uh, When Harry Met Sally. The scene where, where, uh, what, where Meg Ryan had, fakes the orgasm, and then that old lady says, I'll have what she's having. That was in there. They still have, they have like the table marked. You can go in there and see it. In fact, Anthony Bourdain was asked at Tufts University if there was a place in the entire world where he could eat a late night food. Where would it be? He said, Katz's Deli. It's all right. I shouldn't say that. But I'm also not a big like pastrami on rye guy. So over here to the right, you have East Village. This is First Avenue coming up. So once you go up there, you start getting into the East Village. Here to the left, you have Russ and Daughters. This is pretty cool. This man named uh, Russ, Joel Russ, migrated here. 
He started a push cart and then uh, eventually worked his way up to getting a, an entire uh, storefront. It's called Russ and Daughters because he had children and he was hoping to pass his business on to his children. They were all women and at that time it was a big deal. And this is 1935, they became full partners of the business. And back then they say it was the first business in history in the United States to have and daughters attached to the name. But it's very good, it's got like all kinds of, and that's another thing you're gonna find here. A lot of the restaurants here and storefronts started out as push carts, which we're gonna talk about a little later as well. That's a cool little house up there. There's a little house on top of the building there. It's like a little like uh, apartment up there. It's a little duplex that has a little room that's on top. Everyone always loves taking pictures of it. Don't worry, I'll get it in B-roll. So this neighborhood today uh, is very, very expensive and the, the spots aren't usually very big. But back in the day, the Lower East Side was one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in the world, they said. So just imagine this place with about 700 to 1,000 people per acre, per acre. To give you an idea of the density of that, I mean, today in these neighborhoods, like you, you're lucky to get like 50 people per acre. It's just people like multiple families per apartment. You can see the mural there, you see like Basquiat, and some very important Puerto Rican uh, names there. Amiri Baraka, these people who all hung out on the Lower East Side in the East Village. Now this is also, it was a very Puerto Rican neighborhood, the Puerto Ricans and some Dominicans, but the Puerto Ricans started coming here in like the 1950s, 60s in huge numbers. Uh, and they settled a lot in the Lower East Side and the East Village. So this neighborhood's gone through lots of different, uh, I guess, like most neighborhoods in New York. Uh-oh, we're going to the dark, Phil. My boy Phil here gonna be gonna be clicking away at the little. I hate going under these scaffolding things. Everyone always makes fun of New York when they visit here. They're like, there's construction everywhere. There's a saying about New York that it's gonna be a beautiful city if they ever finish it. But uh, I like it, so shut up. Here too, this is Jonas Schimmel. This is super cool. Sorry, I almost passed it. This is Jonas Schimmel Bakery, they specialize in knishes actually. Careful behind you, Phil. I want to kill someone. Since you guys haven't seen Phil, let me describe him to you. He's 6'10", 300 pounds of pure muscle. The most intimidating person on the planet. So you have lots of street art here. These walls were commissioned for street art, which is pretty cool. They let artists come in here and uh, do their thing. And now we have Sarah Roosevelt Park. This is Sarah Roosevelt Park here to the left. A lot of cool uh, basketball. You can come here and play basketball, do all this stuff. Obviously, like any park. I'm not giving you guys any great information with that. But it's named after Sarah Roosevelt, who's actually uh, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt's um, mother, very famous New Yorker, a very famous New York family actually. So the Roosevelts were Knickerbockers. Knickerbocker is the term created by a man named Washington Irving <coughs> to describe families that were of the original Dutch descent. So they like could trace their ancestors to the Dutch who were here when it was New Amsterdam. So the Roosevelts were one of those, uh, were one of those families. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna keep walking all the way to Bowery. This is Second Avenue. Now it's interesting, I was telling you about the Jewish people here now. People forget that the Jewish population of the entire world is like 14 million, which is not a whole lot if you compare to like the amount of Muslims, which is 1.8 billion, and the amount of Christians, which is like 2.4 billion. So it's like a very small percentage. But they've been able to accomplish a lot, especially here in the United States. So Second Avenue used to be what they called the Yiddish Rialto in the first half of the 1900s when there were so many Jews here. To give you an idea how many came, um, from 1880 to about 1924, they estimate that around 3 million Jews came here to the United States. And that was very different from a lot of the other immigrant groups that were coming here because they came with the intention of staying put. A lot of the immigrant groups that were coming then, the Italians, uh, other groups were coming to just make money and then leave and go back home or send their money and then are just staying what they called birds of season. The Jews were looking to leave the old world behind because they were fleeing some pretty bad persecution. One of the things they say, one of the things that actually happened was in 1881, Tsar Alexander II was assassinated. Oh, hey, it's Borat. No, thank you. Look at that. That's right. You're right. Borat, the movie Borat came out today. So now we're gonna take a left on Bowery. 
So anyway, Tsar Alexander II is assassinated, right? Aww. And they blame it on Jewish conspiracy, and so they start what they called pogroms in Eastern Europe and Russia, basically like, you know, state-sponsored terrorism. You know, thousands of people killed, displaced, entire villages burned to the ground. So the Jews, they were like, let's get the hell out of here. So they left, and they came here. And you gotta keep in mind, too, at that time, the Jews who lived over there didn't feel a part of any country because they were so uh, persecuted even before that. They were put in ghetto, ghettos and shtetls. What are they called? Like shtetls, they're like these little villages. And so they took that kind of mentality here, and they set up little villages pretty much here in the Lower East Side. So in the 19, early 1900s, you had a ton of Jewish people come to this area and set up shop. And it became kind of like this renaissance. And I was telling you about the Yiddish Rialto. You had authors, uh, all these descendants of those same Jewish immigrants. You did a lot of great things here. Let me go to Roger. You can see all this kitchen appliance and stuff. In fact, here on Bowery and down on Delancey, you have a lot of the kitchen appliance and like uh, restaurant equipment uh, stores here. But this is Bowery, which is named Bowery because that's the word for, that's the old Dutch word for farm. And this is the street that used to lead to Peter Stuyvesant's farm, which was the East Village back then. Peter Stuyvesant was the first director, I'm sorry, the last director general of uh, New Amsterdam before the British took over in 1664 and renamed it New York. Oh, look at that. So when he got kicked out, they basically sent him packing. and they're like, get the hell out of here. They sent him to his place up here, and he just kind of retired up here, but he had the East Village, was pretty much all his neighborhood, all his farm. Also, too, another thing to keep in mind about this street, we're gonna cut to the left. You know what, actually, let's go this way. <laughs> Audible, sorry, Phil. <laughs> Phil, knows what he's got. Phil knows what he's doing, don't feel sorry for Phil. Bowery used to be the Skid Row of New York too, by the way. One, it used to have tracks, elevated railway tracks going up the middle. And when you have ele elevated railway tracks, it tends to depress the land value around it, meaning that it makes for, you know, a poorer neighborhood, etc. So you have here the Bowery Mission, which is an old homeless shelter and stuff. But you had, it was back then, it was all like drunks and uh, drug addicts, but a lot of it has changed. Here to the left, you have the new museum which is modern art. So we're walking by the Boundary Mission here to the left, and then you can start seeing, uh, still see a lot of the restaurant supplies, but I was saying before, you can see a lot of the uh, Chinese lettering because Chinatown is just south of here. And uh, it kind of bleeds up here because, by the way, it's one of five Chinatowns, the one here in Manhattan, and it's growing. This is a cool story, that building there, that building right there used to be a bank building. It was bought in the late 60s, that big tall with the green cornice. That was uh, actually bought by a man named Jay Mizell. He was a photographer. He bought it in the late 60s for like 190000 He just sold it a couple years ago for, they say, around $60 million. So he made kind of a killing on that. But that's just to show you, I guess, what has happened in the neighborhood over time. It's gotten a lot more expensive. It's been gentrified. It's crazy, but Bowery was the worst street in the entire city. And today, it's a very fancy neighborhood, very expensive part of the Lower East Side. A lot of big condos and fancy hotels. But you can still see a lot of the old architecture that's still here in the Lower East Side. These are all tenement buildings. These are kind of a characteristic of the Lower East Side. See like the fire escapes, people go out there and they smoke their uh, legal cigarettes, their legal tobacco cigarettes, I'm sure. If Freeman's here to the left, it's like this little alleyway that goes to a restaurant. All right, Phil, you're gonna stop and turn me around? Yeah, there it is. <laughs> but these buildings were designed for immigrants. They're actually designed for immigrants. So when immigrants started pouring in in the 1830s, the city was having problems fitting them in their, their, ho in their homes and making densely populated neighborhoods. Big problem, right? It was gross, loud, whatever. So the city started to take it on themselves. They designed the tenement building. And over time, the, the, the actual structure and the design of them evolved because they were having problems. Fires, filth, etc. So there were multiple laws, 1867, 1879, and then 1901 are the new law, which are the modern tenement buildings. And they dealt with the amount of bathrooms, the amount of light that the actual buildings had. But these tenements, wherever you see them in New York, means that they had immigrants in the neighborhoods. Lower East Side, Greenwich Village, all, uh, all those neighborhoods had lots of immigrants at one point. Kind of crazy, loud, it's always loud in here. And this is, uh, we're gonna go back through Sarah Roosevelt Park into uh, the Lower East Side. Pretty cool neighborhood though, uh, very fancy now, a lot of partying here. In fact, the neighborhood uh, here, the people who live in the neighborhood, 
We're always getting mad. They're always getting mad because there's always party in here. A lot of bros like to yell and fight and throw up in the street. This was another place where there was, uh, where there used to be an elevated railway casting a shadow. Now this is Sarah Roosevelt Park. This is Rivington. So I was telling you that this land was owned by a man named James Delancey Jr., right? Well, James Rivington was a, uh, he was a Tory, uh, a, an associate of, of of James Delancey Jr., who was also a Tory. A Tory meaning they sided with the British during the American Revolution. Problem is, Rivington switched sides, and he eventually became a spy for the uh, United States, the, the Continental Army. But that's what this is named after. So a lot of the streets are named after things that pertain to Delancey, or uh, things that he liked. For example, the street orchard, which we'll be walking by here shortly was named because that was the apple orchard of James Lancey Jr. Oh, look at that, isn't that crazy? Ugh! But you can see there's people out and stuff. Everyone loves to crap on New York. Everyone's always in the comments section firing away their fingers saying New York is dead. <laughs> Get out of here. There's still people here. Yeah, there's not a ton of tourists. Some of the businesses are struggling right now specifically, but that's why you buy local. You go to the local businesses, don't go to the Starbucks and all that stuff, but it'll be fine. New York's, New York's finding its way. And it's not like any cities are thriving right now, so you keep it to yourself. So now we're walking through Allen, and you can see that there's like a little park in the middle. This used to be an elevated railway that passed all the way up, just like, just like the one over on Bowery did. And this was actually a prostitution haven back in the day. Um, yeah, I know some of you freaks and creeps who are watching this are like, oh, what's the name of that again, Allen? Well, it's not anymore, so. But yeah, you can see this used to be an elevated railway. It's now a little park. Now we're going to cut into what's kind of really the Lower East Side. This is more the, uh, what's uh, traditionally considered the Lower East Side. You guys heard them speaking Spanish. Hablando Español. Porque hay muchos hispanos aquí en esta zona. But yeah, there's a lot of Latinos here. So we're walking on Orchard now. This is the street that was named after Delancey's Orchard back in the day. Now we're walking north. So what this is now, it's a lot of like boutique shops, places where people go shopping, shoes, all kinds of stuff like that. But these tiny apartments that used to house two or three different uh, families or whatever, and tons of boarders and things like that, are now, you know, millions of dollars, a million dollar apartment. You can still see the tenements, the fire escapes, like I was saying, those ended up being required because there were lots of fires. In fact, the Lower East Side suffered a lot from fires in the first half of the 1800s. So what happened was initially, in the mid-1800s, this neighborhood was stocked with lots of Germans and Irish because they were the big immigrant groups at that time. It wasn't until the late 1800s, like I said before, that the Jews started coming in in big numbers. And that's when it became a Jewish neighborhood. <laughs> so here you have Arlene's Grocery. This was actually a bodega that was bought and then they, they took over a butcher shop and now it's a music venue, super cool. This is like in the mid-90s it got taken over, but. Um, Jeff Buckley used to perform here. The Strokes got their start here. The Bravery were a resident house band here. Ooh. You guys know Jeff Buckley? He's the guy who sings that song. Uh, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That was pretty good, right, Phil? That's pretty Thanks, man. And here you have another store. So this is pianos. This used to actually be a piano store. And they copied Arlene's Grocery by just keeping the name of what it used to be, which was a piano store. And now it's a music venue too. It's been there since uh, 2000, early 2000, 2002, I believe. But a really cool music venue too. Done some comedy shows there as well as Arlene's Grocery. They do comedy shows there. Uh, yeah, no big deal. I'm a comedian. But uh, now we're walking towards Essex. That's another thing about this neighborhood. The streets in this neighborhood are named, some of the streets like Essex, Suffolk, Norfolk, are named after counties in uh, England because of Delancey. He was such a fan of the English. By the way, after the Revolutionary War, Delancey got booted out of the United States, the new United States, and they took all his land and partitioned it off for him. That's what happens. Hey, look, this guy's filming hey, something. You see that, Phil? They were filming something. I don't know, but their camera was way better than ours. <laughs> Damn it. That being said, uh, you know, 
I got my Patreon up and running. If you want to donate money, <laughs> that'll help us. I'll do. I'll, I'll uh, thank you. Sick plug. I don't think that counts as a sick plug, but. But uh, yeah, the Patreon's up and running. If you want to donate, um, I'll put the link here, wherever. Okay, so we're on Essex Street. Let's get this out here. You can see this way. So Essex Street um, cuts north south. Uh, very, oh, that's a little bright. I guess stay out here. You can see a lot of the new developments. Beauty in Essex, this used to be like a little pawn shop that they turned into a music venue here. Uh, not music venue, sorry, a, a party venue. Like going out all the time. People go out and they get dressed to the nines waiting outside. And you go in, like the stairs are behind like where the counter of the pawn shop used to be. And then up there to the left, you have the old Essex market. So I was telling you that this area used to be super densely populated. And there were push carts all over the place up until the 1930s. The push carts were outlawed eventually by Fiorello LaGuardia because they were dirty. They caused a lot of congestion. So to replace them, he said, oh, all right, all right, I'll give you guys something. So he created this Essex market up here on the left. There's this big open space inside where they could set up their stalls and all that stuff. It was eventually moved and we'll walk by the new one a little later. You also have these different uh, restaurants. We're walking by, like this one says El Castillo de Jagua. Like this is a little Latin restaurant behind this truck, Phil. But you have that, you have El Nuevo Amanecer, which uh, El Nuevo Amanecer is also here nearby. Uh, those are both, uh, the one, that one is actually, El Nuevo Amanecer is actually a Dominican restaurant. You have lots of Dominicans here, uh, or not as much anymore, but in New York, I mean. And you also have here, this is a big one. This is Economy Candy. This is super cool. This has been here since the 1930s. And what happened was, it started out as a shoe store that sold candy outside on a, from a cart. But during the Great Depression, the candy became more popular than the shoes and stuff, so they just switched it to candy. And the actual generation, I think it's like fourth generation owners, the same owners, uh, the owners are still within the family from the original owners. And Ludlow, we're crossing Ludlow Street. Ludlow got its name from the War of 1812. They took the names of famous figures from the War of 1812, Ludlow, Eldridge, Allen, those were all people who uh, played a role in that War of 1812. Which, by the way, they built a bunch of forts here in New York for the War of 1812 because New York City was so important during the American Revolution. Uh, they learned their lesson, the Americans. They're like, all right, we're going to protect it this time around. So they built uh, Castle Clinton, Castle Williams on Governor's Island. They built a few. And uh, they never used any of them. Fort Wood, which is now what the Statue of Liberty sits on top of. Did you know that, Phil? No. I didn't think so. All right, we're walking back to Allen. So I was, I was talking about the uh, Latino immigrants here. The Latinx immigrants, sorry. I'm not used to saying Latinx. I don't know. Anyways, I was talking about that and the Dominican restaurants that we just passed by. The Dominicans started coming in the mid-1960s, actually. Uh, one of the reasons was uh, the Trujillo dictatorship ended in 1962 when he died. And then in 1965, a lot of the quotas that were implemented in the 1920s were lifted. 1924, actually. The quotas were lifted in 1965, and that began a new wave of immigration. Specifically immigration from Latin American company, uh, countries and Asian countries. Let's go this way, Phil. I don't like getting under these things. Is that weird? A little bit. I don't like the darkness. I don't like it. It just creeps me out. It's depressing. That person's probably in that car like, what the hell is this guy doing? He sees two, he sees, uh, two hulking men walking towards his car. I don't know if I mentioned this, but Phil is seven foot four, 370 pounds of pure muscle. You can't curse, Phil. But like I said, you can see here, you can see lots of the different uh, Chinese lettering. You see the church grace to Fujianese. Fujianese are a lot of the Chinese immigrants that are coming here. They're coming from the Fujian province of China. The Chinese immigrants also started pouring in in the 1960s, around the same time as the Latin Americans. So the Puerto Ricans were the main Latin American uh, group in the uh, East Village, but uh, Dominicans also came in numbers, but a lot of them settled in the north of Manhattan. They settled in what is today Washington Heights. To give you an idea, the Dominicans are the second most populated Latin American community here in New York. They're around like 600,000, they think. But the Puerto Ricans are first. In fact, there are like 700,000 Puerto Ricans in New York City, which is a lot. That's like the size of the city of San Francisco. Is this too bright, Phil? 
So now we're on Delancey. If you continue this way, you get back to Bowery, uh, which is over here. And then you can walk, we're walking Delancey now, which is named after James Delancey Jr. I was telling you the other man was Henry Rutgers, who owned a lot of land in this area. You can see Moscote. Moscote is, uh, since 1915, is uh, glasses, as is, as is Cohen's, which is right here. These were eyewear specialists. Both of them started, Jack Cohen and Hyman Moscote started peddling push carts and selling glasses that way. And they eventually worked their way up to storefronts and they're still owned by descendants of the family. You also have the tenement museum right there. Um, so this is kind of a cool story. There was a, a tenement there, right there on, on Orchard that was basically boarded up. The, all the upper floors were boarded up from the 1930s and they only used the bottom floors. So they didn't discover that until the 1980s when they just accidentally went upstairs and they found out that it was pretty much a time capsule to when it was a tenement building from the 1860s. Thousands of people lived in that building and another building that they claim. And so they're just basically like these museums of what it used to be like to live in that. Pretty cool museum actually. So if you continue to the south here, you're still in the Lower East Side. You're getting more uh, closer to uh, Chinatown, actually. But it's still the Lower East Side. We're not going to go there because we don't have time. Remember, this isn't a full tour, all right? So chill out, because if you want the full tour, you got to come to New York. you got to come, uh, you know, look me up, you know, whatever. This is just to be a little, a little overview. But there you can see to the right, Essex Market. Now I was telling you, so the, 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 this, the periods of, of, I guess, this neighborhood. At first, it was land that was partitioned off for living, right? Then you had the Germans, a lot of Germans, Irish. This was kind of an extension of the Five Points back in the day. It wasn't the Five Points, but it was still that kind of rate, uh, racial buildup. Then in the late 1800s, it becomes Eastern European uh, Jews, some Italians. Then the Jews stopped coming in the 1920s, pretty much, with those new laws that were implemented, the quotas. And then in mid-1900s, a lot of Latin Americans come in, Puerto Ricans. But today, it's a very fancy neighborhood. We've talked about this before but a lot of gentrification. Let's cross here, Phil. We're crossing Delancey now. Back here you have the Henry Street Settlement above McDonald's. The Henry Street Settlement was started down on Henry Street to the south, but it was started to help immigrants kind of assimilate and figure things out. It was started by a woman named Lillian Wald, very important. A lot of these, a lot of these associations existed back then because they needed it. They needed it to figure out how to live here. Lots of newspapers and things started to, to cater to immigrants as well. Over here to the left, you have the Essex Market. Since 2019, it's been here. Way more expensive in this spot. You can't tell that building is kind of a kind of a douchey building, very fancy, expensive building. So it's not cheap anymore. It's not a not what it used to be. But like I said, the Essex Market dates back to 1818, when it was actually a, mar a covered market of push carts up here on Grand Street, which we'll see in a second. So now we're walking into the part south of Delancey. We're going to be starting to get into Chinatown here very soon and then we're gonna turn back up and take you guys to Manhattan Bridge to finish. But here you'll see the pickle guys. A lot of, a lot of the different foods you'll see in this neighborhood date back to when it was a Jewish neighborhood. The pickles, for example, you have Bialis, you have uh, different kinds of places that cater, uh, you have the Russ, Russian Daughters, you have the, the we talked about the Kanish, Yona Shimmel Kanish, which by the way, a Kanish is just like this uh, dough, it, well, it's dough filled with like potato pretty much and it's either fried or baked, but fried, and then you have like this little tiny like outside, it's like kind of cooked, and then the inside's very soft, but then you can put sweet stuff in it as well. You can see all in the, in the distance that giant high rise next to the Manhattan Bridge, pretty ugly. But those are the kind of things that are going up here a lot now. Very out of character with the neighborhood, very expensive. It's changing the character of a lot of these neighborhoods. And not only that, they're also getting tax breaks to do it. So people, a lot of, a lot of, con a lot of complaining going on, a lot of uh, fighting going on regarding those types of things, because they're getting breaks from the city, to basically develop this type of stuff for just people with a lot of money. Over in the distance, you see that clock tower. That's the Jewish Forward Building. That was built in the early 1900s by Abraham Kahan. He actually started the Jewish Forward. It was a Yiddish-speaking newspaper for the Jews that were arriving. And it would explain everything of their new culture, explain like the rules of baseball, it would explain how to live here, all in like conversational Yiddish. Which, by the way, Yiddish uh, was, a, was a language that was very even persecuted in old Eastern Europe and Russia because of all the anti-Semitism, but here they were free to speak Yiddish, and it's still actually uh, today around, but uh, today it's actually a weekly, no longer a daily newspaper. Over here you have the Pickle Guys, which is one of the pickle, uh, the pickle stores that kind of date back to when this was a Jewish neighborhood. You have uh, Bialis, Kosar's Bialis, which has also been here since the 1930s. Um, the Bialy is like this little dough thing with like onions in the middle. It's like a little like, pa uh, not pastry, because it's savory. 
So also, D, you have a lot of the housing projects and things that are in these neighborhoods that have been here since like the mid-1900s. There's a big explosion in these housing projects back then. Remember, it wasn't that nice of a neighborhood back then. So these, a lot of these housing projects are sitting on uh, very expensive real estate. And some of them have actually been converted into um, apartments that you can buy and uh, rent. You also have the donut plant, which is really popular too. All right, let's walk up. We're kind of, this is also Seward Park back there. Seward Park behind those buildings, which by the way is the first municipally uh, constructed playground in the United States, they say, named after uh, William Seward, who bought Alaska from the Russians. He was also, there was an assassination attempt on his life. When they, when they killed Abraham Lincoln in 1865, someone actually tried to kill uh, Seward the same night because he was the Secretary of State. And they were gonna kill the Vice President as well, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson's assassination attempt was, was aborted last second. And Seward, they showed up to his house pretending to give him, to give him medicine because he was sick. The son caught them and was like, yo, you can't go into his room. And the guy panicked, shot his gun, shot his gun while he was fighting with his son, and then was able to escape and get inside the room and stabbed Seward in the face repeatedly. He didn't die, though. He just died. Uh, he ended up surviving, but he had tons of scars from the stab wounds on his face for the rest of his life. You don't hear that in history class. But, of course, Abraham Lincoln gets all the, gets all the publicity. But the Lower East Side, like I said, extremely fancy neighborhood now. Um, it's become very, like, you know, gentrified and, well, who knows what will happen now, I guess, because uh, COVID has kind of changed the city a lot. A lot of these neighborhoods, specifically Lower East Side, uh, East Village, uh, Greenwich Village specifically, Upper East Side, a lot of the residents have left because they have money, so they're like, screw it, I'm going to the Hamptons or going somewhere else. Not me, baby, I'm staying put. Stay put right in uh, Ridgewood, Queens with my roommates. Just me and the gang, hanging out. They actually require you to build, when you build these fancy developments, they require you to build affordable housing. So it's like 80, 20, 20% 20 of it has to be affordable housing if you want to get certain tax breaks. The problem is it's pinned to the like income around the neighborhood, the cost of living around the neighborhood. And if the neighborhood's already expensive, that makes the affordable housing still expensive. So there's lots of problems with that. But the moral of the story, is get involved in your city politics. A lot of people forget they get all caught up in national politics and who hates who and whatever, but none of that stuff, well, very little of that stuff, actually reflects your day to day. The more involved we get in daily in our city and local politics, the more it trickles up actually and will change the national conversation as well. The problem is no one gets involved in anything. So behind me, you can see the uh, Williamsburg Bridge. This is the Williamsburg Bridge, this takes you into Brooklyn it takes you into Williamsburg. In fact, a lot of the Jews who left this area after they had kind of already gotten settled or whatever, they went over to Williamsburg. And in fact, in fact, actually now North Williamsburg is the biggest Orthodox Jewish community uh, there in Bed Stuy. And you go over there, it's just all Orthodox Jews. And then to the north is like North Williamsburg, which is where all the, you know, the cool kids live. <laughs> you know, I don't live there anymore. It's also gotten very expensive. That's the Williamsburg Bridge, built in 1903. It was the longest suspension bridge in the world when it was finished. Uh, pretty cool. Henry Hornbostel was the architect who actually designed a lot of Emory University, which is where I went to law school. No big deal. Yeah, I went to law school. I don't know if I mentioned that already. <laughs> yeah, I'm making YouTube videos now. Let's move on. Uh, but I think I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the video here. We covered a lot. Pretty cool little, uh, little walk. Uh, but yeah, if you can, please support the Patreon. I would love you forever. Um, it's just got up, so you can just check it out. I'll put the link in the description. Also, to please subscribe. Please follow me on Instagram so I can become an influencer, you know, and uh, model. Uh, yoga pants and uh, Tulum and what else do they, what else do we do what else do they do Phil what else do Instagram influencers do uh, I can show pictures of my butt like this like that just show pictures like that uh, this is what they do they put they, they stand at, at posts with like yoga pants on right that's what you do but uh, anyways that's it um, I really appreciate you guys watching I'm gonna keep making these things as long as uh, I don't get in trouble or whatever or someone thinks I'm a Am I getting in trouble for this? <laughs> I don't know. You know, people get mad at me for making these videos. They're like, you're giving away all your information. First of all, I'm not. There's a lot more stuff that we could talk about. I'm just giving you a quick walk. And second of all, what else am I supposed to be doing? There's no tourists here, you know? And stand-up is pretty much, you know, kind of dying down. So there's not a whole lot to do. So here I am outside. So you're welcome. But anyways, with that, guys, I don't know what to tell you. We did it. Another video in the books, baby. See you later. Sick. <laughs>